but as they so as they trickle in uh, i guess we will get going so we can be respectful of everybody's time uh so thank you everybody for joining us tonight um for those of you who i haven't had the pleasure of meeting yet my name is Jake Casillo, I'm the Outreach Coordinator here at Amanusi Conservation Trust. Um, also joining us from ACT tonight, we have Joanne Jones um, and our speaker, Man of the Hour, Dave Gavatsky. So before I turn it over to them, just wanted to go over a couple things um, as far as how tonight is going to run. Um, Dave, while Dave is giving his presentation, we ask that everybody stay muted. You can keep your camera on or off. Um, but this way, no background sounds are interfering with it, and we can we can hear Dave nice and clearly. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to um, put them into the chat. We will be doing Q and A at the end, so whatever questions end up in the chat, we will go through um, after Dave's presentation. Um, also, at the end, if you know how to use that little raise your hand feature under the reactions at the bottom of your screen, and you'd prefer to ask your question to Dave on camera, that's totally fine. We will also keep an eye out for that. So whichever method you're more comfortable of asking your questions. Um, if you get kicked out of the Zoom for any reason, you lose connection, um, knock your computer over. Um, if you can't get back in, uh, this is being recorded. So any spots that you miss, if you miss maybe a five minute stretch, uh, we will send out a link this coming week. Um, or maybe even by the end of the week with a recording of the presentation so you can make up for what you missed. Uh, so with all that in mind, I'm going to turn it over to Joanne. Thanks, Jake. So my name is Joanne Jones, and I am an ACT trustee as well as a member of the Outreach Committee at ACT. And I would like to thank all of you for attending our talk tonight on old growth forests. Our speaker tonight is Dave Gavatsky, who many of you may already know. Um, Dave's career was with the U.S. Forest Service, where he worked for over 30 years as a forester and a forest fire management officer. Um, he is also the co-author of the book Forests for the People, the story of the Eastern National Forests, and has written numerous articles on forest history and White Mountain history, a lot of which are available online. Um, in addition, Dave is an active volunteer for several organizations, including being a volunteer county coordinator for both New Hampshire's Big Tree Program and the Old Growth Forest Network. So thank you, Dave, for spending time with us tonight. And I'll now turn the program over to you. <laughs> well, thanks. Thanks, Joanne. And thanks, um, uh, Jake, for inviting me to, to do a presentation on one of my, my favorite uh, topics, which is um, trees and forests and especially old growth forests. So I'll go ahead and get started here. Um, and I also wanted to thank Joanne for all the work, volunteer work that she and Kevin, her husband, do on the trails, uh, both for ACT and at the Pondicherry National Wildlife Refuge and, and elsewhere. So it's it's always a pleasure running into them out in the woods when they're carrying <laughs> their saws and loppers and, and that. So, um, all right, so let's go ahead and get started. This will take about, you know, 50 minutes. And uh, I don't know, Jake might be able to offer one college credit for this course, but I'm not sure he's authorized, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> uh, this is a picture of an old growth forest in Tamworth. Uh, Joanne asked about that. It's the Big Pines Natural Area, and I'll be talking about that a little bit later. So um, we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, some of the topics we'll talk about, trying to define what an old growth forest is. And, and I want to give you some tools on how to identify what an old growth forest is. So when you're walking out in the woods, you'll know that. Um, we'll certainly talk about why they're important and how much old growth forest is left in, in New Hampshire and, and um, in places where we can see the old growth forest here in New Hampshire. And maybe, maybe I should go and, and mention how much that we have left in New Hampshire. Well, New Hampshire is the second most forested state in the nation at 79%. Um, we have about 4.7 million acres of forest land. It's defined as forest land. And we have less than 1%, uh, you know, that'd be somewhere in the range of, you know, 46,000 acres. But we're continuing to do inventories of what's out there. And we know that there's a lot of forests that are starting to reach that age and structural 
complexity that that they can be classified in the future as old growth forest. So I've I've got a definition. I mean, there's lots of definitions. I've been working with the Forest Service. Um, we were working on definitions in the late 1980s, and we still don't have one because forests are really very complex. You know, if you go out into the forest of the Pacific Northwest, you know, you're talking trees that are a thousand years old and, you know, much larger diameter and much different characteristics. So for New Hampshire and particularly in the White Mountains, um, I use the, you know, it's a pretty broad definition, but I think it works pretty well as a starting point. It's a natural forest that has developed over a long period of time uh, generally 150 years or more, it's not been disturbed by stand replacing events such as logging, windstorms, or forest fires. And there's a lot of other names that people have used, and I, I typically go with old growth forest that, you know, sometimes I actually have a hyphen between old and growth, but for, for this, I just keep it simple. Uh, ancient forests is another term. The state of New Hampshire likes to use the term old forest, and that's fine too. Uh, primeval, you've probably heard that. Virgin forest, uh, that is where, you know, forests essentially haven't had any, any timber harvesting or that, but, you know, there's so much man-made impact that we have, whether it's from air pollution or invasive exotic pests that, you know, nothing is really, you know, pristine anymore. And there's some other terms, you know, the loggers might call it over mature or decadent forest. Um, scientists in Europe like to use the term primary forest and, and ecologists in the United States sometimes use the term late successional forest. And, you know, they all have their, their baggage with them. Um, legacy forest, I think is actually one of the more attractive names, but um, I, I just go with the term old growth forest. And I think that's what most people go with. Um, so what are some of the characteristics? And I'll be showing you pictures of these and some examples, but generally we see a lot of large old trees. Typically in New Hampshire, we see tr trees that are 20 inches in diameter at breast height. And we call that DBH, diameter breast height. That's 4.5 feet um, off the ground. And that's just the standard measurement that foresters and ecologists use. Um, so large old trees, typically 20 inches and often over 30 inches in, in size and lots of structural diversity, trees of varying sizes, ages and heights in the canopy, uh, lots of snags, a snag is a standing dead tree. And another term that we call coarse woody debris. Uh, these are branches and, and potentially logs that are on the ground that are three inches in diameter or larger. Fine woody debris is, is one inch to three inches. Uh, we see a lack of humid disturbance, such as stone walls, roads, um, cellar holes, things like that. And we have a term we call pit and mound, um, or pillow and cradle is another term, topography, and I'll show you some pictures to explain that. And other things like nurse logs, nurse stumps, canopy gaps, broken top trees, lots of mosses and lichens, and lots of uh, cavity and, and hollow trees. So this is, um, you know, one of the trees here. This is uh, in Franconia Notch State Park, and I know many of you are from the Franconia area. Um, this is a yellow birch, and, and, and this particular area is, is really quite famous for um, its yellow birch. It's probably the most significant um, component of of the Franconia Notch State Park Forest. And this is that area, and I'll, I'll send out a link to you. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I hit the button a little bit too soon. Um, that describes the Franconia Notch uh, old forest. So that's a diameter tape that I have hanging there that just gives you a little bit of uh, scale. So we use a variety of tools to determine um, you know, what an old growth forest is. And one of them is, is what we call an increment bore. And there's three parts of it. It's a extractor up on top, uh, or we sometimes call it a spoon. And then we have an auger, which is hollow, uh, where we put the extractor in, and then there's a handle. And we find 
the centermost part of the tree and we drill into it. And then we put the extractor in and then we, we pull it out. We're able to count the rings. It's a lot easier than taking a chainsaw and cutting this, this old tree down. But um, here's an example of, of tree rings and, and how we count the ages. And there's different ways of doing it, but we wanna to try to find the first year's growth here in the center, um, the, what we call a pith. And then we just count, um, well, there's other two other things you should know that tree rings, there's actually two tree rings per year. The, uh, the spring wood is um, typically the widest and it, it tends to be the lightest. And then the late summer wood we have, it's the darker wood. And I keep hitting that button there. I'm gonna have to keep my hands free here. So, <laughs> so I count the dark rings. I start in the the inside and I just count the dark rings and I, I go on out. Um, and that's how we do it. You know, when you have, when you have three or 400 rings, it, it really is a little bit tough to count such as you see in this particular picture here. And this is a, a 28 inch um, diameter at breast height, red spruce that was found um, on Mount Sunapee State Park in an old growth forest. There'd been a proposal for, um, an expansion of a ski area at, at the state park and, and and for the state to do any work they bring in typically an ecologist to make sure that you know there's nothing there that's that's a rare rarity and and chris kane a friend of mine actually happened to take some of these core samplings he said wow these trees are really unusual and and you can see that um on the bottom here he's taking some notes he took this on 5 27 1997 east side of Bonanza Ski Trail. There's a bunch of ski trails going through there, unfortunately, but on Mount Sunapee. And the diameter is 28.5 inches and he counted 180 rings. So it's a tree that's 180 years old. So this determined that this area is an old growth forest. And I've, I've gone through there with, um, with Chris and others and it's an amazing place. So it actually halted some of the ski trail development that was proposed for that area here. Because I mean, Let's face it, we have less than, well, probably have one half of 1% of the forest of New Hampshire that's, that's in old or old growth forest. And another tool that we use is actually um, looking at the bark. Um, the tree on the left is a black birch. We don't have black birch up here in, in, um, in, in the White Mountains or north of the White Mountains. And this is down at Pisca State Park. And this particular black birch, you know, most people wouldn't be able to tell what it was because these bark, it's just so, so many, looks like these big plates and it's on a cold air talus slope. So it's a fairly slow growing site. It was never logged. Um, it's one of those spectacular old growth forest. Um, the tree on the right is actually a money tree. You know, well, actually it's Money doesn't grow on trees, although some people think it does. I only had a two-dollar bill. That's that's all I make because it's a Jefferson. I live in Jefferson, and uh, and so I, I tend to use that. But uh, but take a look at that bark, and and you can see it's it's really big plates on that. So that's a pretty good indicator uh, if if you've looked at enough bark in your life that that's at least a hundred and fifty years old. Uh, so a yellow birch can live almost to 400 years in age. And, uh, and some of the trees that uh, are in Crawford Notch State Park and the Dry River Old Growth Forest are in excess of 250 years. Uh, here's another large one. And this is in the Lafayette Brook Old Growth Forest. This is, uh, you probably know it as Old Route 3, um, the Hugh Galen Wayside area. Um, and just an amazing uh, tree that's, that's in there. So structural diversity is very important um, when we're looking at an old growth forest. It's, it's not just gonna be a 150 year old plantation of red pine, for instance. It's, it's gonna have a lot of diversity, both in the size of the trees, the position in the canopy, uh, and the amount of um, species and, and uh, young and, and dead and dying trees. Uh, this is in Chatham, New Hampshire, at a place called Mountain Pond Research Natural Area. And, and in the foreground, you can see on the left, a hemlock and then a yellow birch, uh, a sugar maple, and there's some, 
some younger beech that's coming in on the understory, and there's also some spruce coming in. And it's, it's an amazing story on how this particular forest at Mountain Pond was saved. It was supposed to have been logged. It was a logging railroad. It was very close to it, but the landowner didn't log it. And eventually it made its way into the White Mountain National Forest. And, and today it's a, a essentially a research natural area where people study what the forest uh, you know, would look like if they had never been logged. And Bradford Pines Natural Area, this is off of Interstate 89 in the town of Bradford. Bradford's a really neat town in the center part of the state. And it's got a, a number of uh, interesting natural features. And Bradford Pines, um, I took a picture of the snag here and it shows you a very large white pine. Um, the actual old growth area is, is probably only about 10 acres in size, but it's pretty spectacular. It's located on a geological feature called an esker, so it's a lot of sand and, and, um, and gravel. Another feature about old growth forest is that um, you have lots of hollow trees and hollow logs where it provides excellent habitat for wildlife and for people like my friend here, John Pastore, who's checking out this live but really hollow sugar maple at the Mountain Pond uh, uh, Research Natural Area. So that, that tree is around 10 feet in circumference. So it's around uh, 37 inches in, in diameter at breast height. So um, there's a lot of value in, in leaving hollow trees and, um, you know, for, for anything from bats and bees to bears and uh, porcupines and, and, uh, and other animals that live there. So, uh, so and this quote here, just living trees with internal pockets decay, lots of top die back or broken tops, they're important wildlife habitat. And these trees, often stand longer than snags because snags have a tendency to fall over in, in the wind. So keeping these, these uh, living trees with these pockets of decay and dieback is really important. And, and in the forestry profession, um, you know, we're always trying to improve the quality of the woodlot. So we often take those trees out that are, that are hollow or have, have some cavities in it. And, and that's probably not a good idea if your objective is to increase the amount of wildlife that you have. So, um, I mean, trees, woodpeckers use, um, I heard them today, uh, a pileated woodpecker using a dead top of a tree because it really resonates over a, a large area. And, and um, hollow trees certainly used for roosting, denning, nesting, and, and foraging. Um, uh, bats love to use these and, and even bees. So um, that's in a publication called Science Findings. Um, old growth forest, there's a certain number of wildlife that enjoy using old growth forest because there's not only the habitat for, uh, for nesting and, and for cover, they have lots of food there. And so this is the Gibbs Brook Research Natural Area in the White Mountain National Forest that's in Crawford Notch. It's about 1,600 acres. And American Martin are often seen um, in this particular area. This is a species that we call arboreal. It spends most of its time up in trees hunting red squirrels. It'll, it'll go for snowshoe hare and, and mice and, and that, but it really can chase up a tree going after a red squirrel. And, uh, and a little bit more on these hollow trees, uh, there's American basswood on the left here. And this is probably a gray squirrel that's in here. It could be a raccoon. I, I didn't see any sign of either one, but uh, it was certainly a hollow tree where they're using. American beech on the right. And you know it's, it's alive and it's gonna be there for a long time. And again, cavity trees used by so many different species of wildlife, and they're really common in, in old growth forest. And if we had to have an iconic mammal of New Hampshire's old growth forest, it would be the um, northern flying squirrel uh, or the southern flying squirrel. The northern flying squirrel tends to like the conifer forest or, or mixed um, hardwood conifer forest. 
And the Southern Flying Squirrel typically is found more in our Northern hardwood, beech, birch, and, and maple old growth forest. Uh, nocturnal species, um, lucky to see them in the daytime. And coarse woody material, as I indicated, um, the coarse material is three inches in diameter above, fine is less than three inches. And this certainly is, is uh, you know, quite coarse material. So old growth forest, you typically have a lot of this lying around and it's habitat for all kinds of amphibians, particularly salamanders. And, but it also, you know, there's a lot of fungus that uh, grows on that, which decompose the, uh, the wood. So, you know, a live tree is really important when it's, when it's alive, uh, when it's standing as, as a dead tree, and even when it's lying down on the ground. So, um, you know, we value all of these particular features. Uh, this slide won't be on the, on the test at the end here, but um, <laughs> it just shows you an example of, um, you know, how trees decompose. And if we're doing an inventory, of an area, we'll, we'll take what are called plots and then uh, go a certain distance and take another plot and determine um, you know, how many logs that we have and how many trees and what their status is. So uh, that's, that's what the forest ecologists use. So again, uh, this is actually in Snyder Brook, lots of uh, really good coarse woody debris here. And amphibians love um, coarse woody debris because these logs that are lying there, they're, they're virtual reservoirs, they're, they're rotting. And so there's a lot of moisture that soaks in there. Um, and, and this is a red F here. So again, another picture in Snyder Brook. And, and this is a nurse log. Uh, you can also have nurse stumps and you can see some yellow birch and some hemlock uh, saplings coming in, growing on this, um, uh, feather moss that's here and you can see some fungus and so often that the trees do really well by having this particular um, structure here with that amount of moisture that's found here. Um, here's a nurse log. Um, if you can see my my cursor here, is a, there's a white birch here. You can see the peeling bark. There's maples, there's spruce, white spruce actually. Uh, there's a, another, it looks like a, a yellow birch coming in here. And it's on this, on this particular nurse log, which was an old white spruce tree that had fallen down. There's a uh, 45 acre old growth forest in the Pondicherry National Wildlife Refuge. And I know several of you have been out there with me on a on tours. Um, stilt roots, and I'll, I'll show you several pictures of them. There's a stilt root at, at Pondicherry. This is white spruce. So the, at one time there was a stump here and it, it eventually decayed away. And so all you have are these tree roots that look like stilts. Here's another one. This is, it, it may be a little bit hard to see. This is a hemlock growing on a stump. Uh, it does really well, and then eventually the, the root system will go down into the ground and it'll decay away and uh, you'll have uh, uh, what you see here, uh, some more stilt roots. And this is in Lafayette Brook. Um, I occasionally lead hikes. I don't lead it at this time of the year because there's too much snow and a lot of holes in the ground there and it'd be a little bit too dangerous. But uh, if you're interested in a hike, maybe late in the summer or in the fall, it's a wonderful place to go. No trail out there, mm -hmm. but uh, worth visiting. Uh, canopy gaps are openings where trees have died and that's where you get this age class diversity. Uh, you've had a tree that died here and another one that died here. So you get all of the sunlight and you get this intense growth that's coming in. You've got the logs on the ground and, and it just really creates this um, uh, structural diversity. Uh, pit and mound topography, um, you know, one way we can tell um, that that areas had been uh, farmed before is when they've been, re they're really flat and it doesn't look like there's any stumps or stones or anything like that. Whereas here, there are, there are pits, uh, you know, depressions where trees have tipped over and then there's mounds and, and this really kind of a messy looking foreground here is what we call pit and mound topography. So let's take a, a, another look at one. So when trees, 
tip over, we call them blowdowns or wind throw. Um, and they pull up a, what we call a root wad and it forms a mound after you know, 10, 20, 30 years, it decomposes, but you still have this really big mound that's left behind. And where all of the soil was pulled up, you have a pit. And this pit is microhabitat. It's an area where it's going to be a lot moister. Um, you're going to have maybe things like frogs and salamanders that are going to be down in there. And so you're going to have different vegetation that grows in the pit than you do on the mound, which tends to be more of that mineral soil. And so again, that helps create that habitat diversity here. And here's another picture here, and you can see a, a tree had tipped over. Uh, and this white birch, paper birch, is probably about 40 years old. I, I didn't do a coring on it, but um, I could tell by the height and the diameter uh, pretty much what it was like. And here's again the pit. So we also call it pillow and cradle. Pit and mound is, is, is what I use, but you may see the other term. So oftentimes people will look at a tree and it may be 20 inches in diameter and say, wow, that's a really old tree. Do you think it's, you know, 500 years old or something? Well, you know, some trees just grow really, really fast. White pine, eastern white pine tends to grow really fast. Um, and, and basswood tends to grow fast. Even northern red oak grows pretty fast. And so it's a little bit hard to tell. You can tell a little bit more with tree height, but uh, diameter is sometimes tough. Now, you can go to bogs. Uh, I'll take a three inch diameter black spruce and it could be 150 years old. I, I've seen that many times. Now this, this is interesting here. These are hemlocks that have been suppressed. And suppressed, they don't get enough sunlight because there's a major overstory over them. And these trees uh, were dated at over 100 years of age. So they're kind of flat topped in here. But once some of these trees start to die out and you get all the sunlight coming in, these trees will just take off. And hemlock will live for up to 550 years of, of age. That's the record. We're lucky to see it 400 years of age here in, in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. Uh, again, we talked about trees with broken tops. Uh, here's a couple. These are in the dry river old growth forest in, in Crawford Notch at the state park. Um, another term that we use for them is stag topped. And a stag is a deer with antlers and it kind of looks like that. So, you know, these trees have been around for well over 150 years, 200 years, and they've gone through a lot of winters and a lot of tough weather and a lot of hurricanes and a lot of the tops have, have broken off. So pretty characteristic when you see these broken tops that it, it could very well be a old growth forest. And when you put everything together, it really helps. And mosses and lichens are, are pretty common in these forests because they tend to be a lot wetter and more, uh, certainly more moist. In fact, you know, I've seen where you have an old growth forest and you've had a forest fire and this cut over land and it comes up to the old growth forest and it just drops down because there's what we call a moisture of extinction. The um, uh, the logs that are in there and everything else are just so full of moisture that they don't burn. Uh, many of us are familiar with the uh, old man's beard lichen and uh, northern parallel warblers love to use this, this lichen as a nesting material here. And necaria is a shingle moss that we see in, uh, growing on, on trees uh, quite often too. And you've probably heard uh, of the you know, World Wide Web, which is our internet. And of course, a person, um, Suzanne Samard is a forest ecologist from British Columbia. And she wrote a book um, on, on old growth forest. Uh, and, and she was interviewed in a magazine, Nature Magazine. And the editor came up with this term, Wood Wide Web. And it's, it's really true that trees form these mycorrhizal networks that go in between the trees. You can see a a yellow birch tree here with a hemlock, uh, they're fused together. And, and underground, you have this incredible network. And Suzanne Samard really popularized this, this idea that trees can actually share nutrients uh, at different times of the year and keep trees alive. And, uh, and quite fascinating uh, uh, to look at. 
Uh, so it, trees, you know, as I said, you know, even when they're a log lying on the ground, it's, you know, it's best to leave them. Uh, I know, you know, many Americans have this idea that we need to tidy up the forest, but sometimes an untidy forest is a much healthier forest because you have all of these decomposers that are coming in here, uh, which help you know, put it back into the soil. Coral mushroom, honey mushrooms, we saw lots of them last year because we had a fairly wet summer. Uh, taking a look at some of the iconic birds that we have in old growth forest, certainly the pileated woodpecker is, is one that we would expect to see there. They, they tend to need large trees for their cavities and they're always looking for trees that are, that are dying where they can find their carpenter ants. But then again, you get these small birds such as the brown creeper, which loves to forage on, on bark and, and often will nest um, uh, in, in between these you know, flaking bark layers. And so always lots of uh, insects that they're looking for. And winter wrens, um, they use these tip up mounds often for, for nesting. And they just love these tangles of trees where they can, um, you know, find the, the right kind of habitat to live in. So um, I heard my first two winter wrens a couple days ago at, at Pondicherry. So, so they're around. And other birds uh, that we call eruptive species that show up in the winter time are looking for places that have lots of um, food from cone crops, whether it's uh, spruce cones or uh, pine cones or, or even balsam fir. So um, this is a red cross bill, a male, and uh, these tend to, you know, favor the, the white pine um, old growth forest, whereas the white wing crossbills tend to go for the spruce and, and hemlock and um, tamarack forest. They tend to go with the smaller cones than, than that. And in the summertime, we, we have these uh, visitors, even though we think there are birds, they're really from you know the neotropical regions, the Central and, and South America. They come all the way up here because we have such an incredible population of, of insects. And the Blackburnian warbler is one of those. And this is one of those to, that in another, oh, a month or so, we'll be seeing lots of them and our neck will be feeling them because we have to put our head way back with our binoculars to try to find these uh, birds with the, with the fire throat on them. So um, a lot of birds, uh, are actually much more common in, in these old growth forests than they are in these uh, younger uh, forests. So that's where you would, you would see them. That one's on a, standing on a, on a hemlock. So old growth forests are of course important in terms of um, you know, carbon, which is one of the factors that's affecting climate change. And, and real quick here, I'll, I'll mention that um, there's a difference between carbon sequestration and carbon storage. And I'll start on the right. Uh, these older trees, they're bigger trees, they store a lot more carbon, which is what we're trying to do. We're trying to take it out of the atmosphere and trying to figure out ways to do it. So um, old growth forests store a large amount of this carbon and um, and you know, typically uh, up to about 200 years of age, and they're still storing, and a lot of it ends up into the soil where it doesn't go into the atmosphere. Whereas uh, you know, you occasionally hear these stories. Well, we need to sequester more more carbon, and that's really the rate at which a tree uh, stores carbon. And and obviously, trees when they're you know 30 to 70 years old, they're growing pretty fast, um, and they can they can sequester carbon uh, that rate tends to slow down as trees get older. But the fact is, if, if we were looking to store carbon, it's probably a better thing by leaving more of these big older trees around to, uh, to do that. So that's what we really should be looking at. So um, again, uh, Professor Bill Keaton uh, at the University of Vermont published this uh, and I just took the, the quote out here, older forests in Eastern North America, they're less vulnerable to climate change than younger forest and particularly for carbon storage, timber production uh, and biodiversity. So um, interesting uh, studies that, that tend to lend proof to this. So let's take a look at um, 
several of our really interesting old growth forests. We'll take a tour of the state. And Chesterfield Gorge is a uh, state uh, natural area. It's down by Keene, so it's in the southwestern part of the state. And I don't know if any of you have been down there, but it's but it's really an interesting walk trail and, and that whole part of the state is 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 really worth going down to uh Keene is a nice uh, nice town uh just a wonderful gorge that's down here the trees probably 180 to 200 years of age primarily hemlock with, with some red oak and and white pine uh in there uh i mentioned the uh mount sunapee state park which is in newberry in central new hampshire um it's a place to see um, uh, red spruce. Here's, here's a old growth red spruce that escaped the 1938 hurricane, uh, sheltered in, in, um, on this one side of the mountain. Here's some big, another big yellow birch in here. It's a big American beach in, behind John over here. And we see some uh, hobble bush that's flowering. We were there last, I think it was in maybe October. Uh, if you go to Hanover or Norwich, Vermont, a really interesting walk is this, I think they call it the goat path, um, or maybe it's, yeah, I think it's called the goat path at Pine Park in Hanover. And I have some handouts that will describe, uh, has links to the maps and things like that. And I'll have, uh, Jake will send them out to you if you signed up for the program here. So it's right along the Connecticut River. Uh, it was protected by the people of Hanover around 1910. And uh, there was a lot of white pine and red oak and hemlock growing there. Uh, I don't recommend doing it at this time of the year because it's a little bit icy and it's really quite steep going down to the river. So you don't want to end up in the, in the water. Uh, but in, uh, later on in the year, it's, it's really nice to, <clears throat> to go and visit there. There's parking at the Ledyard Canoe Club or at the Country Club in, in Hanover. You can get out to it that way. Uh, again, this is a big white pine. These trees are you know, 130 feet tall, so, so they're really quite large. Uh, there's Girl Brook Gorge that's in here. Uh, the trail goes by it. A pretty interesting habitat. You can see some fine, silty soils. Uh, there's actually black maple that grows in this kind of habitat near here. And that's a pretty rare tree in, in New Hampshire, at least. It's more common in Pennsylvania. Uh, okay, back to Bradford Pines. Uh, this is me standing by one of these uh, 140 foot tall uh, Eastern white pine trees that's, um, that's here. They actually have lightning rods. That was a condition of the gift that was given to the uh, to the state of New Hampshire, and that somebody actually had to climb this tree and put a lightning rod up and a cable. So uh, interesting. So good place to visit. Uh, here's Big Pines Natural Area at Hemingway State Forest uh, in Tamworth. Uh, it's a wonderful hike. You can do well, you can do about three miles and go um, up to Big Hill where there's a, a fire lookout tower. I wrote an article about it and I, I'll have a link to that. And so uh, you might want to check that out. It's a, it's really a neat, neat place to see it. Uh, interesting about Hemingway, um, uh, Florence Hemingway was actually uh, the woman who founded, one of two women her, and, and her cousin founded the National Audubon Society. They're um, socialites from the Boston area and they were opposed to the killing of birds to you know, use the feathers on the hats. And, and she led the effort to ban this in Massachusetts. It later became a federal law and she founded the Massachusetts Audubon Society and the, uh, the National Audubon Society and did you know, quite a bit of other work. And, and her husband had a place in, in um, Tamworth, a couple thousand acres. And when he, he passed away in I think 1931, they donated it to the state of New Hampshire. So a beautiful place to visit. So here's some of the trees that are there and you can see these trees are really, really big. Chris Kane is using what's called a Biltmore stick on the left here to measure the diameter. It's a, of a Eastern hemlock tree. 
really big, big tree, probably 250 years uh, old or more. Um, I like to use a Biltmore stick because it's a pretty fast way of um, rapidly determining uh, diameters as opposed to using a D-tape because you have to walk all the way around the tree. And uh, Christine Tappan and Sarah Rob Grieco from the um, uh, Old Growth Forest Network, Chris is also in that, we're out measuring this um, Eastern white pine and it was um, 58 inches in diameter. So it's about 12 feet around and it's 155 feet tall. So um, I think it's the tallest tree in, um, in New Hampshire, certainly. And it's one of the tallest trees in the Northeast. So um, right along the trail. Uh, Greeley Ponds uh, is in Mad River Notch, which is um, one of the most spectacular of our roadless notches in New Hampshire. And, and many of you have probably been there and didn't realize it's um, actually a scenic area of the White Mountain National Forest. It was protected in 1927 um, by Philip Ayers and the citizens of Waterville Valley and the state of New Hampshire from a proposed logging railroad that was going to go through this spectacular notch. That's that's a ridge of Mount Cancamaugus that I'm looking at. And, on my other side behind me is Mount Osceola, the east peak of Osceola. And there's there's two really gorgeous ponds in here. Um, the upper pond is about 26 feet in depth, only two acres in size, but it has Eastern brook trout. And it has this uh, old growth spruce and Northern hardwood forest that's, uh, that's in there that's never been caught. And, and this is Osceola on, on the right side here. Uh, very gravelly bottom. Um, this is the upper pond. Um, and you can, you can really appreciate how wild this is. And what would have happened had a logging railroad come through this particular area? They would have cut everything you know, up as high as they possibly could have. And at that particular time, we were having lots of forest fires that just a few years earlier, there was a 1200 acre BB River fire that had you know, devastated the forest, killed at least one person. And so the people in Waterville Valley and elsewhere were really opposed to the idea of a logging railroad. They convinced the US government to buy this. And at that time, the US government through the Forest Service was only buying typically cut over forest land. So they, they they were told that they had to buy it, so they did. And so they had to pay a higher price to the international paper company. And But anyways, it's protected now. And I think it went for like $12 an acre. And I mean, even if you went and looked at, um, you know, the interest rate uh, since 1927, I could I probably figure it out. It's usually probably be around $160 an acre is what the the taxpayer of New Hampshire, of, of the United States paid for this incredibly spectacular area here. And now it's protected and, and has a wonderful trail going through it. So great place to see in, in, uh, in, in late May and June, uh, different kind, the two trilliums that we have. Um, this is Jamie Lewis here. He's the, um, um, the chief researcher for the Forest History Society. We're on a hike in here looking at this old growth forest. And uh, he was really quite impressed by it. And he's coming from the area of the Great Smokies and the Blue Ridge where there's some, some really nice old growth forest. And I mentioned this one earlier, this is Mountain Pond, old growth forest in Chatham. Um, it's, it's near North Conway. Um, and again, and I mean, it's only three tenths of a mile walk in to the start of this. Uh, there's loons that nest out here in the summertime. And the old growth forest is, uh, is really quite spectacular. Another picture of it, uh, you see a yellow blaze on the trail here. And I mentioned the dry river uh, old growth, um, which is in Hart's location in Crawford Notch State Park. Um, easy walking trail, it's right off a of 302 and you can make a you know one or two mile loop and, 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 and go and visit it. Uh, I wrote up an article about this. And again, I, I'm pretty sure I put a link to that um, that, that Jake can send out to you. A longer hike, if you really wanna get up uh, and do a nine mile round trip hike, it's the Nancy Brook Research Natural Air. 
And it's probably the largest old growth forest that we have in New Hampshire at 1500 acres. It's primarily red spruce and, um, and balsam fir, but there's two wonderful ponds that are up there, uh, Nancy Pond and Norcross Pond. Norcross Pond is probably my favorite pond in the, in the White Mountains. And it's, it was never logged. It was just really inaccessible. And then um, Franconia Notch, um, uh, the old old forest in Franconia Notch, and and here's a picture on the left, a summertime picture, and here's a picture from several hours ago. I was just out there, and here's the parking area um, at the trailhead for the Lonesome uh, Lake uh, Trail, and you can see this this uh, yellow birch here, and you see how the top was broken off here, and so you know Franconia uh, Notch State Park has some really incredible old growth forest. And, and I know many of you have driven that road a hundred times or more, and you're, you're going by some spectacular old growth and may not have known about it. So um, I will be leading a hike out here on, on Saturday. Unfortunately, it's already full, but maybe we can lead another hike uh, in the future. For those going on that hike, you really are gonna need to have micro spikes. It's quite icy. This is one of the few areas that actually didn't have much, uh, much ice on it. But this, um, this yellow birch, it's uh, almost 80 feet tall. Um, and you can look at that old bark. And I, I measured it today and it was, uh, we'll call it 36.9 inches or 37 inches in diameter. That's, that's over 10 feet around. And the yellow birch here is, is just so unusual in that you're at almost at 2000 feet in elevation and it's still massive uh, in size, much bigger than you find in most places in, in New Hampshire. A couple examples of the stilt rooting that um, we'll see. It's right along the, the trail here with a with a um, the old stumps or the logs have rotted out. So you know these trees actually do do pretty well. They they stay there pretty well. Um, you saw this picture earlier. Here's a actually a burl on this, this is a abnormal growth. You see a lot of burls in the forest and and um, Franconia Notch. Another interesting fact, couple facts about Franconia Notch. I think it's one of the last single lane sections of the interstate highway system um, in the United States. I think, I think there might be one in Colorado still, but this may be the last one. And the second thing is that it probably has more salt put down per mile than any other comparable uh, road in the United States. And it's due to the construction of the road where they had to have a, a divider with a, that metal barrier. Uh, it tends to accumulate snow and it melts. And so people go off the road, so they have to salt it really heavily. And so it's really affected the, uh, the trees that are there, particularly the American uh, beach. And of course it affects the water quality in there for, for trout to have all of that um, sodium going into the water. Again, another uh, you know big yellow birch and, and, and having these large trees, whether they're conifers or deciduous trees like this is, is so important for shading these streams. Plus you have lots of insects that are falling off the trees into the water. So it's, it's important for this uh, healthy aquatic life. And, uh, and for our Eastern brook trout, this is what helps keep our, our streams cold. If you, if you had them open, they'd be exposed to sunlight and just wouldn't, wouldn't be able to survive as well. So moving up from um, the old forest at Franconia um, uh, Notch, Lafayette Brook is, and I think you all know the um, Artist Bluff and uh, of course Echo Lake here. And this is Eagle Cliff. Um, and this is a uh, overpass that takes you down to the U Gale and Wayside area. And this, this forest has never been cut. This is a red spruce, uh, eastern hemlock forest that grows here and there's occasionally some yellow birch and as you get a little bit further down towards Lafayette Brook it, it uh, turns more into sugar maple yellow birch and, and white ash and then once you hit um, pretty much Lafayette Brook it's national forest on that side and that area was logged over 
uh, around 1900 and it burned in 1903. So those trees are actually, you know, pretty young. They're only about 120 years of, uh, of age at the most. But um, there is a trail that goes up this way here. It's not a marked trail. It's not in any of the guidebooks. It's used by climbers primarily. Um, but that's about it. It's, it's tough walking in here. But if you do want to do a hike sometime this fall, I'd be happy to, to lead a hike there. And this is from the U Galen Wayside um, on Lafayette Brook, uh, North Peak of Lafayette, Greenleaf Huts up here. So everything on the right side here is old growth forest, you know, working your way up here. And this is younger forest on the, that's in the national forest here. So uh, quite interesting um, in, in through there. Snyder Brook is 36 acres in size in Randolph, New Hampshire, and it has spectacular hemlock um, and sugar maple. And actually it has some incredibly big aspen trees that are there, some state champion trees, American beech that's in there. It's uh, not particularly wide, it's only 600 feet wide, it goes up for a little over half mile up. Um, but that is a really, really, it's one of my favorite old growth forests. And you can reach it from the Appalachia parking lot on, on Route 2. And of course, we have lots of, um, you know, wilderness. Um, uh, well, we're above tree line here. I'm on the Gulf Side Trail. But, you know, down, down in, in the Great Gulf, much of this was never cut. They logging, the Libby Company did log some of the lower portions here. But, you know, there is, there is some older forests that, that are found at these, you know, rocky high elevation sites, you know, do we classify it as old growth, you know, because most of the trees are what we call crumb holts that are probably okay. five inches in diameter or less, but, you know, they're above 200 years of age. So, you know, there's, there's certainly wildlife that, um, you know, use that. Another picture of the Great Gulf Wilderness, Spalding Pond down here. Um, another unusual one is this um, uh, Norton Pool East Inlet, which is um, uh, currently owned by the Nature Conservancy. It's one of their preserves uh, in Pittsburgh, New Hampshire. And about the only feasible way to reach it, uh, I can assure you, is by either canoe or kayak. Uh, trying to go in on, on foot is problematic. It's very, very difficult to get in there. Uh, but this has been proposed to be one of the the first old growth forest network site uh, in New Hampshire and Nature Conservancy will you know, have it designated. And it was protected by two foresters um, that worked for one of the paper companies. And they just said, you know, it's just not worth going in there to cut these trees. Let's keep a example uh, of a couple hundred acres of what the original spruce fir forest was like. And so thanks to them, we, we um, have this area protected. So I'm right on time here and uh, I'll leave you with a, a picture of an old growth <laughs> forest and the salutation of, may the forest be with you. And I think I stole that from Star Wars, may the forest be with you. So I'll <laughs> stop sharing my screen here and, uh, and, uh, and Joanne or uh, Jake, if you could tell me if you, what, what we have for questions here. Yeah, thank you. First of all, thank you so much, uh, Dave, for sharing that. I especially like just knowing knowing where they are. Uh, I think that's a huge problem people have is just understanding where old growth is. I know I constantly am looking at trying to find different maps online, so I'll probably tap you as a resource there. Um, you bet. And, and, <laughs> and in fact, we're going to be having a conference in September of 2023 at the uh, Geneva Point Conference Center on, uh, in Moultonboro. It's going to be an old growth conference, and I think it's the 20th through the 22nd of uh, September of 2023, and it's going to be um, featuring three days of uh, hikes to old growth forest, and then um, I think morning sessions that we're going to be learning about old growth forest, wildlife habitat, Native American use of, of old growth forest, and then, um, you know, some of the... Um, 
spiritual values that you get out of out of old growth so um it'll be reasonably priced um and it's going to be offered by the university of new hampshire extension service so i'm, I'm working with a team to to develop that so maybe we'll recruit you as one of our uh guides and uh and <laughs> have you join us on that yeah i'll i'll put that on my calendar that sounds, sounds okay. really interesting um so yeah if anybody has any questions um feel free to pop them into the chat or if you want to use your uh, raise hand feature um, on Zoom, we can get around to calling on you. Alex, we got one question um, or two questions rather from from uh, Barbara Bald. Uh, the first is what causes burls? Um, then to follow that, uh, where is Greeley Ponds? Okay, I'll, I'll answer the the um, the second one first. Greeley Ponds can be reached from from two directions from the Kankamaugus Highway. Uh, coming in from Lincoln, if you know where the Lincoln Woods uh, Visitor Center is, it's, it's where there's a bridge across the Pemigewasset River. It's uh, a little less than five miles heading east towards uh, uh, Kankamaugus Pass. And there's a trailhead called the Greeley Ponds Trailhead. And there's, there's room for about a dozen cars there. And the second way is to go to Waterville Valley. The uh, Greeley Ponds Trail ends up at um, the old Depot Camp Trailhead. And um, there is a map of Waterville Valley that you can get, or, or any of the maps have um, you know, pretty good coverage of, of um, Mad River Notch. Um, most people know Mad River Notch more by the name Greeley Ponds because um, you know, that seems to be an attraction. Uh, but um, its official name is Mad River Notch, and that's where the Mad River starts, and appropriately named because that river can get really wild and crazy. Uh, you're, and in fact, I'm writing an article. It's got to be out uh, tomorrow afternoon for the UNH Extension on, on a hike to there, and I'll talk a little bit about the history of that particular one. I, I do a series for Extension every every six weeks, and so we'll, we'll send you links to some of those. Um, the second question was, what causes a burl? And burls are, um, it's a, a growth on a tree that is an abnormal growth, often where there's been, you know, some kind of a, a injury to the tree. And all of a sudden you have this cellular structure that's just growing crazy and just growing, you know, just wild, tends to grow up faster in some areas. And, um, and it, it, it forms these, what look like boils uh, on a tree. And that's, we don't really understand all of the factors. Uh, witch's broom is another thing and you get this abnormal growth. Uh, you know, some people can compare it to types of cancer that just, you know, starts growing really crazy, but it is that abnormal cell growth. And, you know, people actually collect these, these burls. They go to log yards where, you know, the loggers have cut trees and they'll ask if they can buy the burls because you can make a bowl out of them. Uh, wood turners love to get them and really have some some wonderful, um, uh, you know, shapes and and patterns uh, that are in there. So hopefully that answered your question. Looks like it did. Um, okay. So yeah, uh, if anybody else has any questions, feel free to pop them in there. Um, if somebody's typing. Uh, I actually have a question, um, possibly related to Burles, but um, you mentioned, especially with that quote from the professor from UVM, yeah. that old growth forests tend to be more resilient towards a lot of different um, factors regarding climate change. Um, one thing that we talked about, if anybody was in um, our Hubbard Brook Research um, Foundation meeting a while back, now you can go find it on, on our YouTube, um, one thing that and Theo Valley touched on was that a lot of diseases and particularly invasive species um, as well are creeping further north. Uh, so I guess what what level of resilience do old growth forests have that maybe a younger forest don't have to um, things like emerald ash borer if it's an old stand with a lot of old ash trees or um, any other diseases that seem to be kind of making their way further north to maybe yeah. north of the notches. Well, we're certainly very concerned about a lot of these forest pests that are coming uh, in. And, and one of the 
ones, and there's several that are really threatening is, is the hemlock woolly adelgid. And that's actually in uh, right on the edge of our territory. It's in Jackson, New Hampshire. So it's, it's not quite in, um, in Coas County, but it's very close. And, and that is a, uh, a needle uh, eating insect that, that is going to kill a lot of the, um, uh, of the hemlock trees. But what we're finding is that cold temperatures have been uh, important to control the spread of, of the hemlock woolly adelgid. So uh, they seem to be reaching a certain elevation and you get these temperatures of 20 and 30 below zero. And that's why I, you know, I, I, I pray for 30 below zero weather. I know a lot of people don't like that, but if, you know, we get a week of that, um, you know, really cold mornings, it will kill off a lot of the hemlock woolly adelgid and the balsam woolly adelgid, which, uh, which is uh, also a pest of our, um, our balsam fir forest. Now the emerald ash borer, we're finding that some trees are what we call lingering ash. They, they, they can actually defeat the emerald ash borer and actually kill it. Uh, but unfortunately, what we're finding is, is only about one or 2% of those ash trees that can do that. But it typically are those larger ash trees that uh, are able to survive much longer. And the same thing with, with the hemlock trees. It's the younger hemlocks, the younger ash trees that, that tend to die uh, you know, a lot quicker. Um, yeah, there's some, there's several other pests that we're concerned about, oak wilt and, and that, and, and, and that can be uh, you know, problematic. We don't have it in New Hampshire yet, uh, but we're keeping an eye on it. So uh, hemlock woolly adelgid is really the one that scares me because you know, that's a tree that it's gonna be 450 years old and to lose those legacy trees. And we've seen what's, what's happened in the Southern United States in the Appalachians there that we've lost a lot of the hemlock. Um, that are there. Now, other invasive species, you know, we're thinking buckthorn and Japanese knotweed and, and that, those typically come in where there's a lot of light exposure. Um, um, and, and, and these old growth forests typically don't, I mean, there's disturbance to get these root wads, but I, I have yet to find any invasive plants that come in on, on the old growth forest. So at least yet. But you never know. <laughs> Give it some time, maybe. Hopefully not. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions for Dave while we got him? Um, I will, if it is all right with him, I'll include his contact information. I send out all those mm -hmm. all those links exactly. next week, and maybe people can. And I'll hear um... your ear off a little bit more. I'll, I'll send you uh, some additional references that with, with the links and uh, you, you can send that out. And I think folks will be able to uh, check out some of the videos that are out there and some of the articles that I wrote and with, which has more directions um, on, on visiting some of these different old growth forests. So Great. thank you Hello. again, everyone. Yeah, thank you everyone for and, uh, joining us. We look Look forward to seeing you out on the trail. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Right. Have a good one.